Hey, thank you everyone for joining in and welcome to this uh, new session of Zobin Talk. Today is going to be a really interesting session and I have with me Sharmila. Uh, Sharmila Kanan is working at Kensium as a vice president and uh, it's really great to have you here. She's got experience in everything in HR, right? From culture building, anal analyzing people, campus hiring, training and development. She's got a gamut of experience. And I think this, this session is going to be really, really interesting. Uh, welcome, Sharmila. Welcome to Zobin Talks. It's great to have you here. Thanks, Amrit. And thank you so much for having me here. So, Sharmila, you've got, you've got 18 years of experience, right? If I, if I, if I get that number right. Uh, walk us through how did you end up in HR and uh, tell us a little bit about your journey over the past 18 years in your corporate life so that some of our, our people can understand where are you coming from. Definitely. That's a very interesting question, uh, Amrit, because um, I, I don't think I'm an HR profession uh, by design. It, it's it's just a chance and it's, it's just about taking opportunities that life gave. Uh, so I... Like most of the people in my generation, I started my career with BPO operations. Uh, that was a cool happening thing uh, 18, 19 years ago. And from BPO operations, uh, the natural transition happened into learning and development. I was with learning and development for almost six to seven years. And within learning and development, there is a lot that uh, people learn. And that's where... Uh, probably the first seeds of being an HR professional came into play. One was uh, because, you know, you, you get to meet so many new people when you're training them. So as a trainer, the first thing that you uh, get to know is you get to understand people's personalities. That sort of drew a further inclination to take up a professional learning in the field of HR. Uh, after LND, I moved into employee engagement primarily because... Uh, that was an area of interest to see, you know, what can you do? How do you keep your staff engaged? And uh, initially, when I was on the other side of the fence, it used to be more like, what does HR do? You know, they, they don't have to do anything. They just have to do rangoli. They have to do cake cutting and stuff like that. Until you move, jump the fence and go on to the other side. And then you're, oh my God, there's a lot of science behind this. Yeah. And um, that's where employee engagement uh, happened. Uh, Post-employee engagement, I moved into recruitment and HR operations. And over a span of uh, several years, I think I've tried different organizations, whether it's large multinational corporations in terms of how they manage their human resources to startups, uh, which have a completely different way of managing human resources, right? So whether it's a large-sized company, a mid-sized company, a startup, each one of them has a distinctive approach to human resources. And I've been fortunate enough to work with all the three segments, different industries like banking, uh, product development companies, services-based companies. So I think uh, a lot of that experience assimilated in uh, joining on board with uh, Kenzium. It's been a great uh, journey with Kenzium so far. It's an organization with people first approach. And I think uh, when when you have a management that backs you in terms of human resource efforts, you enjoy working there. So that's been the journey so far. Great. I think uh, your journey has been so good that when when we were looking at your profile, we saw, okay, 40 under 40 HR award, top 100 uh, great HR managers. So you you're definitely selling yourself short if you don't specify as to, you know, uh, you've gotten so many awards. I'm pretty sure that uh, your your journey across enterprises, services companies, product companies has been great because you don't end up with with these kind of awards if if you're not uh, you know really putting some kind of impact impact over there. Uh, given the fact that you know people with uh, 18 years of experience and having seen so many changes, you're also able to foresee to a certain extent, what is going to happen next? So having seen so many changes in uh, the entire uh, HR world, from employee engagement to uh, recruitment uh, to culture management, what do you think is the next set of changes which is going to happen, let's say, two, three years down the line? If you had to put your thinking cap on, where do you think are the changes going to happen in terms of any of these areas in HR? 
Sure. I think uh, if, if we have to talk about changes in HR, Amrit, it's, uh, you know, I would like to uh, probably divide it into the pre-COVID area and, uh, and, and the post-COVID uh, era. Like, uh, I guess most of the organizations, the HR professionals were on the toe during the COVID era in terms of uh, getting the organizations aligned to the new way of working, ensuring uh, physical fitness, mental wellness, and things like that. And that's where I think a lot of organizations realize the importance of human resources as a function. And it's moved from being a support function to a core business partner. And in some of the organizations, it's a separate line of business by itself. Uh, if you have to look at the reading on the wall, it's it's definitely AI and a lot of things to do with AI. Uh, I wouldn't say that AI is taking over our jobs and stuff like that because that's very far-fetched. And uh, I feel it's it's a wonderful tool to use uh, that can be used in terms of recruitment, that can be used in terms of your employee engagement efforts. It also can be used amazingly in your diversity and inclusion efforts in terms of ensuring that there are no biases uh, when you're hiring people or uh, you're ensuring that you're reaching out to a larger talent pool. So I think uh, now the reading on the wall is how well human professionals or human resources professionals can uh, leverage AI in different aspects. Like there are unlimited uh, possibilities. It's just about uh, seeing what works for each organization. Awesome. I think that's that's something that we also tell all our customers. Uh, and, and internally, we tell them that, don't worry, AI is not going to eat your jobs. Absolutely. AI is not necessarily just artificial intelligence. It is augmented intelligence. Whenever you are in uh, human resources or people management, there is a word human or people in that. You cannot take out the people part or the human part of it. So there is someone who is taking the decision, but the AI is just helping them acting as a co-pilot that's yes. why we always say that when we uh, are trying to say that okay there is ai in this particular part of hr it is augmented intelligence we are giving them the the data now it's best that they understand the context and take the decision on on their behalf that's that's something that we always uh, tell tell all our uh, customers that don't worry about uh, don't worry about ai Absolutely. It's nothing to be fear of. I think it's a very powerful tool and when used rightly, it can do wonders for your organization. Sure. So you, as, as an organization, you've done uh, a lot of hiring as well, a lot of recruitment. Uh, we'll start with, with campus recruitment. Sure. Uh, because maximum amount of changes in terms of pre-COVID versus post-COVID has happened in university hiring and fresher hiring campus recruitment. Right. What has been your process uh, with, with respect to campus recruitment, A, and B, how do you think has AI uh, helped you in this particular task or this particular activity? Sure. I, we leverage AI to a great extent, not just in campus recruitment, uh, Amrit, but across all the recruitment uh, or talent acquisition activities that we do here at Kids. One of the most important things that I've seen earlier was a process where, you know, uh, the placement officers are reaching out to you and then you're trying to shortlist a few candidates. You, the concern was in terms of, okay, who's going to travel? Who's going to manage? Who's going to take care of so many people? Where is the bandwidth? These many universities have to be attained. And then you work on a lean staff when you're in human resources, right? So trying to uh, ensure that, you're reaching the top tier universities or the universities where you have best talent and ensuring that you have enough bandwidth to cover everybody without the recruitment fatigue uh, was the biggest challenge for us because you know uh, the teams are traveling across. They are speaking to so many candidates day in and day out that somewhere towards the end of the day or you know when they're when they're done with the activity, they have the challenge of oh my God, I've spoken to so many people, I'm tired, I'm stressed. And uh, a lot of times that also brings in uh, a challenge in decision-making, right? Like we all are humans at the end of the day and there is this decision fatigue every time you are uh, doing campus recruitments. Like uh, we literally have to incentivize teams to, okay, go on the campus and get people. Uh, but once we moved into the AI-based uh, 
options we started exploring them and we started very small like you know we were not sure how it's going to so we started with basic stuff in terms of automating the tests like that was the first baby uh, step and that saved us tremendous amount of time like when we used to uh, go out for bulk hirings or campus recruitments a lot of time uh, there is a person who's sitting who's correcting those papers and then there is somebody who's administering the test you're spending one entire day just doing that activity. With automation of the test, we were able to get the test completed in 15 minutes, the results in 15 minutes, no decision fatigue. The recruiter is all fresh. They're scanning the top 10, top 15 of the candidates, top 15% of the candidates, and they're talking to them. So yeah. there was a lot of time that we were saving. The process became too efficient. That gave us an opportunity to explore this further. This is how can we make this better? You know, we've, we've done paper-based tests and now we move to automated tests. But is there a way that we can leverage AI to probably see a culture fit? And uh, also to see probably how successful this candidate would be in the room. And that's where we started creating ideal personas and putting our core values into the system to see what are the traits required to su be successful at Kenzim. So a lot of things happen. Before that, we uh, interviewed profiles that were successful at Kelsey mm -hmm. in different roles, created a persona, and then fed it into the system. Now, the AI tool started generating uh, questions around uh, how we could assess their personalities. So when we are doing video-based interviews, the tool in the background is assessing the choice of words. It, it's assessing how the person is thinking, what are their traits, what are their personality, or what are the values or ethics that they hold close to. When we finish the interview, we almost have a personality map of the candidate that helps us to understand, uh, is this going to be a right fit? So we've started using uh, some of those uh, tools. Some of them are restricted to hiring leadership profiles. Some of them are specific for campus recruitments, and it depends on the kind of role that you're hiring. Uh, but yes, now we do use artificial intelligence in terms of not just uh, saving our time, but also reaching out to maximum number of candidates and seeing uh, what could be a better fit for the role. And that's, uh, that's brought a significant impact because that's improved our retention rates, the stickiness. And uh, it's also about the learning curve that the candidate has, right? Like if you're hiring the right kind of candidate, they have a lower learning curve. And that has a direct impact on business. But you, you spoke about AI and I think today people understand that, okay, yeah, these are the areas where AI has a really good impact. But there's always one set of people who are asking, there is, there is some bias in AI. And I'm pretty sure that your management also would have asked you when you were implementing these kind of tools. Right. Uh, what is the drawback? Where is the bias? What are the corrective measures? So how did you tackle that, that particular situation related to bias uh, that an AI can produce? What was your internal practice for that? If you can, if you can share that with us. Sure, that, that's a very good question, Amrit. And uh, I think that's a question uh, that's that's quite debatable everywhere. Uh, it also depends on what you're choosing, right? Like uh, all AI tools are coded by humans. There is a certain amount of bias that's definitely going to be there. But if you look at the larger picture, uh, I think AI eliminates the bias related to gender, race, uh, creed, or uh, even in terms of, you know, uh, a lot of times, uh, recruiters give importance to certain pedigree of institutes right uh it's it's you look at the name of the institute and in your head you're like okay this is a good institute the candidate is going to be good that's not necessarily true you know you're generalizing it based on your experience ai doesn't do that okay. so that gives you a lot of uh potential we actually put across case studies uh where uh, one of the things that we used to follow at Kenzium was blind screening. So we removed the names of the candidates. Uh, the CTCs are not something that we discuss with the managers, and they're not supposed to ask that in the interview just to eliminate that, uh, you know, compensation bias. A lot of times, the moment you know the candidate, CTC people think, okay, can I get a better candidate at, at this budget? So we, we had those practices in place. The management was extremely supportive for implementing those practices in place. And uh, 
that was one of the things that we did. So we did have some data in terms of what was the improvement that we had when we started doing blind screening, and that's what we applied to AI. We also uh, showed that, you know, a lot of times there is a gender bias and it's an unconscious gender bias in hiring for certain roles. Uh, if you just remove the name, the gender from the profile and just send across a profile to uh, the hiring manager, there are chances that a lot of women candidates will be picked. But the moment they come into uh, the interview and you know that, you know, this women candidate is properly in an age bracket where uh, they're going to start a family or they, they are in that age of getting married, there is an unconscious bias that you're wondering that, will this person stick around for long, right? So for us, the challenge was more in terms of how do we address uh, that bias. Uh, so that was how we uh, sort of, uh, that's where the Kensium Women's Network came in place. Uh, we had around 15% women population before the Kensium Women's Network came in place. And last year, we hired 36% more women than what we had hired the year before. And that was a combination of our efforts with the Kensian Women's Network and the AI tools that we use for blind screening. And it was like, you like the profile, you're going to interview the candidate, come watch me. So it's, it's a lot of uh, pushing back at times, but it helps. I think I think you should you should write a book on this that <laughs> that HRs and managements can read that this is the uh, impact which happens when with clear intentions and with the right kind of tools uh, and a supportive management if you're able to implement this this is the uh, the effect I mean it's it's so happy to hear uh, these kind of uh, stories. Uh, and also the fact that you were able to train your team internally and tell them that, okay, this is what is happening. It might be a change. You might be uh, not seeing the profile, complete profile of the candidate, but this is for the betterment of the company. The company Absolutely. getting the person matters more than knowing unwanted information. True. I think there was a lot of training and awareness, a lot of pushback and, um, it, it involved getting everybody on the board. You know, you can't uh, have a change management if people, your stakeholders are not buying into that particular change. So we did have, we started with the top leadership first. Then we started with the mid managers explaining why we are doing this. And, you know, also explaining them that you're not losing out anything on the candidate. In terms of what you need for the profile, how does the name matter or how does the gender matter? What, what you're looking in a candidate is basically whether they're fit for the role or not please hire accordingly. So it, it, it took series of conversations uh, and I think a lot of rigor and steadfastness and being shameless about, no, this is what we are going to do. So I think, I think that's, that's great to uh, you know, hear that, that particular part. I'm going to ask you one question, which a lot of people have asked me. Mm -hmm. What, how do you differentiate between going down the path of culture fit versus culture ad because at this point of time you are saying that okay i'm creating an ideal candidate profile right uh, because these candidates have succeeded at at Kensium. Right. these are the kind of traits that i want at a leadership level these are the kind of traits that i want at a mid-management level and probably these are the traits that i want at a entry level yeah. and probably you're you're using ai to fit candidates or match them to the kind of uh, ideal candidate profile or the traits that you want. Don't you think you're losing out on uh, people who can add to the culture, but not necessarily fitting into that box? How do you address this, uh, this dilemma? A very good question, Amrit. And that does happen. So that's when, uh, that's where once we get the candidate profile, the first interview that happens at Kensium is the culture fit assessment. Okay. which is ideally done by me or another senior member in the team, irrespective of the designation that we are hiring for. Uh, and one of the things that we do, our core value is embracing differences and being welcome to differences. And that also means oh, we need to have candidates who might be 70, 80% a culture fit, but would bring the those additional traits which are not there in that particular team. So we have a team heat map, which is conducted where you have rated the teams, whether you know they're at a stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, stage five. This is based on uh, our internal uh, 
alignment of what uh, leadership style a particular leader is following. The team has a heat map. Uh, we ideally compare the results to the heat map to see, okay, what is the match and what could be additionally bought in. So a lot of times, for instance, uh, I'll give you an example. Sales mostly has all male candidates, mm -hmm. aggressive, outgoing, uh, blunt, right? Like that's the job profile that you're looking for, people who are flamboyant. How would it be to have somebody who is probably opposite gender, assertive, and probably has a dedicated enough sales experience? It's that that introducing that one person there is it going to change the team dynamics? There's a lot that we do in complement to the AI. So AI does a part of giving you a personality trait, but finally it's up to us in terms of what we are choosing. So we're very conscious about what we choose. We look at what is the team's heat map. We look at what is the AI tool talking about this candidate. And then we look for those traits that could be a value add. That's Those are some of the questions or our questions are defined in a way where we understand whether this is going to be a complement to the team. Is this going to be a disruptor for the team? Or is this just going to like, you know, settle into the team very easily. The, some of the teams would need disruptors, you know, when they are complacent, when they're doing really well and you need innovation in the team, you need somebody with a disruptor mindset. So mm -hmm. we look at the role, we look at what is the team's uh, current strength and then we'll match it together. So that's where I say, uh, you know, AI is not taking your job because AI is giving you a bit, but there is a human uh, on, on the end of that road who's actually evaluating what the AI is doing and then fixing it with the current organization in the culture. True. It also matters because these are, these are all internal team assessments. Right. Uh, a lot of clients have asked me that, okay, fine, we, we'll do these kind of steps. But can you tell me, Amrit, how frequently should we do this? Do we right. do this once in a year? Do we do this once in a quarter? How much is too much? How much is too less? Yes. So in your experience, because you've been doing this, what do you think has worked for you? These kind of team heat maps, team-based assessments, uh, how frequently do you do it? And what kind of success have you seen when you've changed that, that duration? So uh, it, it also depends a lot on the kind of bandwidth that you have and the kind of organization that you're working for. At uh, Kenzium, we do the team heat maps every quarter. Quarterly. And we don't change the heat maps on quarterly basis. What we do is uh, we do HR one-on-ones with the teams and the inputs that we get from these one-on-ones defines the current heat map of the team. So over a span of a year or over a span of two, three years, you are actually seeing how the team has progressed and declined. What were the patches where they have done well? What were the patches where they have not done well? So... Uh, our one-on-ones are not just those skip level meetings where you're asking, oh, your manager is treating you well. Are you happy and stuff like that? They are designed, there is a questionnaire designed to understand and get responses that would help us understand what's the team's pulse. Uh, are they feeling motivated enough? Uh, what could be uh, the stickiness in the role? And what are the challenges that they're facing? We mm -hmm. take this uh, responses, put them in central teams, and then show it to their respective leaders and the management. Mm -hmm. And we try to put in an action uh, point across. If we see anything in red, that's an area that the leader of that department needs to start working with HR on around those specific areas. So heat maps are something that we do on quarterly basis. But in my experience, I've not seen too much of change when you do it on quarterly basis. It's usually every six months. Mm -hmm. This is also a decent thing to do, but we prefer doing it quarterly. Okay. How do you ensure that an HR below you in your team does mm -hmm. not treat it like just another uh, checkbox tick. I just have to finish this activity, but really asks the right kind of questions to right. elicit the right kind of responses at your level, at a VP level. How are you making sure that uh, people one or two rows below you are asking the right kind of questions and are following the process? What's your take on that? Sure. Uh, interesting question there. It's, it's difficult to always maintain a standardization when you uh, when it's about having a conversation, right? It's it's not that you're rolling out a test and they're filling in responses. We do have a standard questionnaire. 
And uh, what we usually do is we train our teams extensively on how this needs to be done. Mm -hmm. There's also a dip check that happens from me or from somebody senior in the mm -hmm. team uh, where we reach out, we see the responses, we reach out to the other person and we ask them, okay, you spoke to this pop, what was your experience like? Did you feel good about it? Or did you just think you know, it was just, okay, I need to do it every quarter, so I'm just <laughs> doing it. And there's a lot of back and forth that happens. It's it's a very human intensive activity. This is one activity that we have consciously not automated because uh, we want to understand people's emotions when they are talking to us. One of the mandates while doing HR one-on-one, -on -one, if you're dealing with a remote worker or somebody who's in a hybrid, hybrid mode and not in office, is to ensure that they're on a video call. So you're not just looking at the responses. Uh, the HR professionals are trained to understand the body language, to understand you know, that slight smirk, shrinking of eyes, everything so it's been an extensive training uh, but there's a lot of dip check and monitoring that happens to ensure that this is done on uh you know this is done with passion and then uh you don't have the same spock doing it for the same person every time okay. you're rotating the spocks to eliminate any predefined bias that might be there because you know if i've spoken to you last time and i know what are your challenges i'm going to walk into the meeting with those challenges in my head so we want to eliminate those biases. So we keep rotating our HR spots to do those H and ones. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I think uh, internships have become quite mainstream right now. Yes. But it's very interesting that you spoke about a returnship program as well. Uh, right. Could you could you dive deeper into that? Because sure. a lot of companies right now understand the fact that if they want to improve diversity they need a dedicated program for that you can't just keep a mandate that okay we want to increase the diversity from x percent to y percent but not have any dedicated work put into that right. uh i saw that you mentioned you had 15 percent women and then you increase the number of uh hires by 36 percent but walk us through the process like how did you put those building blocks in place to set up a a formal uh, diversity program or a formal program for uh, for returnship. Uh, that's it, it's very interesting that you set it up. So how did you set it up? What were your conversations with the management? Uh, I, I guess there would be some back and forth over there. Uh, so how did you get approval? Because I'm pretty sure that people listening to this will want to know, okay, if, if uh, Sharmila has done this, then I'm pretty sure I'll be able to do this. Help us with that. What were the steps that you did uh, to set up this, this formal uh, returnship program? Sure. Uh, I think this was one tedious uh, journey, Amrit, uh, because it started with founding of Kensium Women's Network, which is a diversity network co-founded by our ex PMO and uh, myself. Uh, this started when I joined Kensium about... Uh, couple of years ago and this was one of the topics that was shared with me that you know we are looking at uh, creating something specific on diversity and inclusion even when I was getting interviewed and that was something that uh, was a deciding factor for me to join Kenzim because it's, it's very difficult to get a management that's uh, pro-diversity a lot of times it's a push agenda mm -hmm. so here it was uh, they were like okay we want to do it but how do we do it and that's where Kenzie Women's Network came in place. Uh, now, when Kenzie Women's Network came in place, we had some soft uh, goals that were established. One of the goals was, of course, to have more women on board, hire more women, and ensure that every team in Kenzie has a female representation. Today, every team in Kenzie has a female representation, right? From sales uh, to coders, everybody. There is not a single team where you won't see a woman. But and by team, you mean department? Every department, yes, okay. every function. Okay. The other thing that we saw was uh, when we were speaking to our uh, consultants who were helping us with setting up of the network, a lot of data showed us that there is a leakage in uh, women coming back to the workforce post-marriage. And that's, this could be because of primarily the caregiving responsibilities that they get into. Uh, and that's, so you have a pool of women who are trained who are experienced, who know how to navigate the organization, 
but who don't have an opportunity to come back to organization because organizations are not flexible enough to get them on board. And that was a pool that we wanted to attract. We came up with a formal proposal of what kind of talent pool is available in the market. We uh, even partnered with several organizations which uh, specialize in getting women back into the main workforce. Uh, we ensure that our branding, our conversations, our presence in these networks was at the top notch so that we could reach out to that talent pool more often. Internally, it was about what is the return on investment, right? At the end of the day, it is, okay, we are putting a budget across this. How do you ensure that you're getting the quality candidates inside and that they will stick around? Now, there is no guarantee that uh, a candidate that we're getting in would stick around. You can only do that when you have a strong culture and you have a strong returnship program. And that's when we decided we'll formalize the returnship program. Now, <coughs> formalizing the returnship program meant adding the blocks of flexibility mm -hmm. because uh, a lot of women, they want to get back to work when their child is a year, year and a half, two years old. They are not completely away from the caregiving responsibilities, but they want, they don't want to have a long break or a long sabbatical in the career. Uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, a lot of times for anybody, whether it's a man or a woman who's taken a break, uh, they almost look like at candidates that don't have value in the job market. And that's, that's the sad reality, no matter however we wrap it. Uh, so our idea was that we need to have a returnship program that will allow women to work part-time initially, where they come back, they shadow a person in that role. Mm -hmm. Okay, So they, they might start off initially with a three-hour, four-hour work day spread across five days a week. They are learning on the go. Mm -hmm. And, you know, once they're comfortable, you slowly move it to five hours, six hours, gradually to a full-time job. Mm -hmm. This could happen anywhere in three months, six months, right? Mm -hmm. So, for instance, if I have to hire somebody in a project management role, the principles remain the same. Even if I've taken the break, the principles remain the same. If I come back, I just need probably three months to understand the uh, working of the organization, whether it's working on a specific uh, model, understand the clients, and then I can move full time. So first thing that we did was we checked with the women candidates who wanted to come back to work. We reached out to specific networks to tap into these candidates, marked the positions as diversity positions, and ensured that we get people who are wanting to come back to work. We reached out to a lot of our own folks who had taken break from Kensium for child care or for taking care of the elderly parents. We were able to get a lot of women folk back into Kensium. So these are people who already know our culture. These are people who worked with our leadership team. Learning curve for them was even smaller, right? And it's it's always uh, good to have people who have worked with you. Uh, they are your brand ambassador. Yep. These women in turn were able to refer us to more women who were looking out for job because usually when they are on a break, they are part of these networks where, you know, okay, I'm looking for a job. Okay, let's let me jump onto this WhatsApp group. Let me sign up for this particular portal. They were actually our brand ambassadors. So it started off with a baby steps. Formalizing the uh, plan took a lot of time. There was a lot of back and forth in terms of convincing the leadership team and convincing the managers that you're going to have a resource only for four hours. Yeah. And that's that's where was the roadblock because people are like, what am I going to do with the resource for four hours? You're only training the resource in four hours. Hmm. So how are, we, how are we even going to manage this? And uh, we were like, try it out. Okay, let's do a pilot. We picked up a department and did a pilot with them first before rolling it out to the entire organization. We managed, uh, we, we took the department that had lesser number of women candidates, mm -hmm. got introduced women candidates on board, put them through with mentors who were pro uh, Kenzie Women's Network so that we get the support. It was more about finding your allies in the organization, setting up these allies to help you, and then formalizing the plan. Uh, there was a lot of course correction because the initial plan that we put in, say, okay, four hours in the first four weeks, five hours, didn't work. Like, you know, Everybody has a different... Why didn't it work? I mean... Because every woman would have a different uh, need for flexibility. Okay. So first month, you're probably giving them four, uh, four hours. 
Next month, we said, okay, we'll move it to five hours. But somebody's probably not comfortable yet. They've not learned it yet. Okay. They have a longer break. So then we started moving the women in different cohorts. Is your break less than two years? Then probably this journey works for you. Oh, Is your that's break that's between more than five years? Then you're going to have a longer uh, curve. Then you might also need to have uh, learn new technologies to get imbibed. So what do we do? We can tie up with institutes and you know we can help you find the right course for you. Okay. You can invest in it. Or we, you could make it as a payment from your salary. How do you want to do it? So giving that kind of flexibility. So women who had lesser career breaks or shorter sabbaticals for them are standard program works. There are women who come back after 10 years of career breaks at Kenzium. And there are people who have taken multiple sabbaticals while they are at Kenzium and have joined us back. Okay. And they're coming back to us. It's a testimony that they are finding that this is the right place for them. And that's that's the success for our returnship program. People coming back to us. They still trust the fact that when they return back to Kensium, they'll still see growth in their career. They see value by, by coming back to the company. Absolutely. Yes. And we are dedicated to ensuring that we have women in leadership. And when we say women in leadership, it's not just about reaching the C-suite or the VP level, right? It starts somewhere. So do you have enough women leads in your team? Mm -hmm. uh, like you're working in a development team. How many women leads do you have? We, we go back to the management. We go back to the function heads and we're like, okay, how many women leaders are you promoting this year? Do you see anybody who needs uh, mentorship? We can offer mentorship. So that's another program that we run in parallel with the returnship program so that women grow. So women, I've realized one thing, Amrita, is women want to come back to an organization where they feel valued. True. Where they know that uh, a maternity break is not going to stop their career from growing. And they know that they have resources uh, that will help them to grow. That has been the foundation of our internship program. That's, that's, you should write the second book right now. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Uh, I, I see a lot of thought being put into culture of the organization. Uh, and the testimony for that is, of course, the success of these, these programs that you mentioned. But you can also uh, quantitatively and qualitatively see it on Glassdoor ratings and all these, these public uh, portals. I want to understand as an organization, where are you in terms of having your employees in office, having your employees work remotely or hybrid? And how has that in any way impacted your culture, your retention. Of course, there, there are pros and cons for everything. I, I can tell you from my side, Zobin, we are a remote first company. All our employees are in different parts of the country. Some of them are in different parts of the world. Yeah. Uh, and we know the yeah. effort that, that goes into maintaining uh, culture. Uh, I want to understand from your side, since you've built a great culture, uh, which work model are you working? are you currently following and how do you ensure that you still build a great culture while being in that that work model sure we have a blended approach so okay. at kenzium uh, our trainees our hr team our facilities and finance team basically the support functions mm -hmm. work five days from office they okay. do have the flexibility of uh, moving into a hybrid mode whenever they want to but it is recommended that you know uh, there is enough representation in office for them because employees reach out to them mm -hmm. why do trainees need to come to office because they are in a learning stage and a lot of the learning happens by seeing someone doing something mm -hmm. you can't do remotely mm -hmm. however once you move from the trainee role we are a hybrid organization and we are also a remote first organization which means to tap into the talent pool across the globe we have people working in remote parts of Ranchi, completely remote. We have people working in US, working who are not based in our Chicago headquarters. They're working remote. We have people working in Poland, people working in Canada, they're working remote. So these are people working in different time zones remotely because they were they don't have access to our offices in that particular area. But that doesn't mean we're going to let go of the talent. If they are if they have the talent, they're the right culture, we want to hire them. 
that's where the remote policy came into place. People who are based in uh, locations where we have physical office spaces, mm -hmm. strongly encourage them to come hybrid. And that's primarily because when you're working 100% remote, I'm sure you will understand this, Amrit, that managing the culture, communication, and collaboration, uh, it, it takes a lot of effort, a lot of challenge. And us being a services organization, collaboration is number one on our charts to work together on any project. So we usually recommend the department heads to create a roster mm -hmm. where they work on the days where other teams are coming. So, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of them pick up Monday, Wednesday, Friday. They say, okay, you know what? The team that I work with and the team that I'm working in mm -hmm. comes on Monday. So I'll come on Monday. So there okay. are days where you'll see office being completely full. What we have seen works best for us is definitely hybrid because there is a lot of collaboration that happens on hybrid. But mm -hmm. we also understand that our employees who are remote, how do we bring them in the Kenzium culture fold? Like there are several employees that we hired during COVID and even now who have never come to office because they are based either in a remote part where we don't have an office space or they haven't had an opportunity to come to uh, Kenzie for either the foundation day or any other day where their team is inviting them over. Mm -hmm. So when you're working remotely, you are a single person in your house or sitting in the front of computer. How do I invite culture in you? How, how do I ensure that? <coughs> That's been our biggest challenge. <coughs> Maintaining culture came with a lot of things, Amrit. So one of the things was our onboarding plan. Mm -hmm. We have a dedicated 15-day HR onboarding. And um, that's where we bring in the leadership videos. Every employee who comes into Kinsium has a 30-minute slot with everybody in the leadership team. Mm -hmm. And uh, what happens in this 30-minute slot is each leader shares their story, shares the story of how their department contributes to Kinsium. Mm -hmm. And uh, probably... Uh, you know, how do you say, infuse a bit of Kenzium's core values in them. Mm -hmm. They share about their journey. They ask about people's journey. Uh, that's one aspect of the onboarding program. We have a lot of virtual events. We have a lot of HR connects. Uh, it's a mandate at Kenzium for managers mm -hmm. to stay connected with their teams on a weekly basis. Okay. And this is not a connection asking about work updates. Mm -hmm. This is a connection where you try and understand how the employee is feeling. We do a lot of uh, team building events specific for teams and also global events where all the five countries are participating in a virtual game and stuff like that. Our all hands uh, has the entire organization joining globally. So there is a lot that we do in terms of constant interaction, in terms of culture. Mm -hmm. We speak a lot about our core values. We have... Uh, signature programs that talk about culture, uh, signature programs that imbibe people slowly and gradually in not just into their team's culture, but also their organization's culture. Having said that, all of this uh, can impact 10, 20%, right? Because this these are mostly uh, awareness sessions and training programs. Culture is a part of a lot of things. And I think uh, the culture ambassadors for us are everybody who's interacting with the employee. Mm -hmm. How do you ensure that they have the right kind of interaction? So there's a lot of stress on how you communicate with your team members, a lot of stress on being responsive, a lot of stress on uh, ensuring that you are there for your team. So although we have five, six different core values, when anybody... Uh, comes to Kenzium, what's the first thing that they see is the culture of health. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example of that, a very recent one. So 12th June is our foundation day. We completed 17 years. Oh. And most of the organizations that I've worked with when it's a foundation day, it's a huge party and you know, you're know you taking people out and you're uh, sponsoring drinks and food and stuff like that. At Kenzium, it's a very different approach. We actually celebrate our foundation day as Kenzium Culture Day or Kenzium Cares Day. And all the employees at Kenzium, we actually shut down business for that particular day and we volunteered to a cause that's close to our heart. So oh, we, we have thousands of people joining in. Uh, they're getting their families 
Like in Hyderabad, we had around 150 people painting a school, rebuilding their library, rebuilding their IT lab. You're not working that day. You're giving it back to the community. Like that's the culture at Kenzium. And we want to ensure that that is the culture that percolates. So how do we do that? When somebody is in, like whether you're working on a project, you're stuck, there are people who are going to jump in and say, I can help. And when you see others doing that, you know that that's what this organization appreciates. You fall in the line. Mm -hmm. That's how we manage our culture. But yes, it's an ongoing effort and it's something that cannot stop. It, it needs to continue. I think, you know, this resonates so much because our foundation day is 26th of March and every year we do something very similar. We have a foundation called Hearts for Hearts Foundation mm -hmm. where there are kids who have uh, some hole in their heart, something of that sort, a heart deformity. And uh, we we volunteer to visit them in the hospital and also monetarily we, we support. So there is a percentage of the profits of March which go towards that particular cause and all the employees wow. in that particular city uh, come down, visit that hospital and it, it, it's definitely a, a good feeling. So I, when you said that, I, I just remember that, yeah, that, that is something that we do every year uh, where, we, where we contribute both a few hours uh, and also we, we contribute monetarily, but we don't shut down business that day. <laughs> I understand. I understand. Well, it's wonderful to hear, you know, because it's, it's about giving back to the community that's given back to you, right? So true, true. it's fun too. Absolutely. I think this this has been a really, really interesting session. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for taking time out. I think we're already out of time. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure that we are going to have people come back and ask me your email ID uh, because they would want to know how did you set up the Kensium Women Network? And they're wanting to know how did you set up the AI for screening for bias. I'm pretty sure people are going to ask me and I'm, I'm going to forward all those queries across to you. Please do. I would be more than happy to help anyone who is looking forward to doing this one step at a time. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Amrit. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Same here. Same here. Thank you, Sharmila. Thank Have you. a great day. Bye. Bye-bye.